Okay, so we're now ready to introduce a couple of other typical types of health insurance plans that you might see. Um, we've talked about the high deductible plan already and what you've learned from the high deductible plan, pretty much all that information is gonna be useful with the other insurance plans we're gonna talk about. Um, remember the high deductible plan, the, the characteristics of it that are important to remember is that of course they have a high deductible, which is bad, but a low premium, which is good. And it also provides an option to invest in an HSA, which the other plans won't provide. So compare that to the high, the high deductible plan to this new one I'm going to introduce now, the comprehensive plan. And you'll see that actually they're very similar. Most of the time they're very similar. Uh, the only difference between these two is basically when do you want to pay? Do you want to be forced into paying regardless with high premiums? Uh, or do you want to have low premiums and take the risk that perhaps you'll end up with a lot of medical expenses? Um, because with the comprehensive plan, you have low deductibles, which is good, but high premiums, which is bad. Okay, so you can basically pick your poison. You can go low deductible, high premium, or you can go low premium, high deductible. However, remember that the high deductible plan has an HSA. The comprehensive plan does it. And for these reasons, you'll see the comprehensive plan is usually not a good plan, uh, sometimes it's slightly better, but it's rarely much better than the high deductible plan. Just to show you some figures for me, this is again real data that comes from my actual insurance plans that are offered to me. Remember, I have a family plan, so it's going to be more expensive than what you're likely to face. But here's my high deductible plan. Those are my options, right? So if I go high deductible, I'm going to pay $280 a month in premiums. No way to get out of that. I've got my deductible of $4,400 and my out-of-pocket maximum of $7,400. Any purchases that are made between these two features, there's where I get that 20% payment that I owe. So once I've hit my deductible but not met my out-of-pocket maximum, I will pay 20% of any medical expenses and my insurer will pay 80%. Okay. Compare that now to the comprehensive plan, you can see that the premiums are much higher, all right, about twice as expensive but the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum are a lot smaller, okay? So what this basically means is, if you knew you're gonna have like really high medical expenses, so let's say that you have like cancer or something, you know, that's gonna lead to very high medical expenses all the time, maybe you're on dialysis, right? Something like that. Um, in that regard, you'll actually see that the comprehensive plan ends up being a bit cheaper. So for people that are very healthy, the high deductible plan is gonna end up being better most of the time. For people that are very unhealthy, the comprehensive plan is gonna be better most of the time. However, for people who are good at personal finance, they may end up on the high deductible plan for their entire lives. The reason is the high deductible plan gives you the HSA. Remember the HSA allows you to take medical expenses and pay them off completely avoiding taxes. So although this plan mathematically is gonna look good in some cases, if you could have saved a bunch of money in an HSA before you start having health problems, staying on the high deductible plan is gonna end up being a good deal for a lot of people because they don't so much mind having high medical expenses when they've got 100 grand sitting in an HSA ready to spend tax-free, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, I talk to people a lot of time and when I, when I give people advice, about you know personal finances this is something that comes up and i hear all the time people say well i can't afford the high deductible plan the reason they'll say that is one of two two things one they don't understand how any of it works that's the more common reason or two they don't have an hsa and at this point they're kind of right you know if you get to 55 years old and you're now having a lot of medical problems and it's you know at that point putting money into an hsa is basically going to go in and then immediately be spent that's not as good as building up your HSA over time and then using it for medical expenses. Um, so my ideal recommendation for most people would be to stick to the high deductible plan when you're young. And in doing so, uh, by the time you're old, you'll have so much in your HSA that covering your medical expenses will be relatively easy. So um, I'm gonna give you guys some mathematical examples on your worksheets that will really explain this out, but I kinda wanna just show you why the comprehensive or high deductible plan could be more valuable. So we're just going to directly compare uh, between the two. And I, I can't recall if I just mentioned, but for the uh, high deductible plan, by the way, when you hit your deductible, 
but you have not hit your, I'm gonna write this down, for the comprehensive plan, because I think I left it off. Just to make sure we understand this, um, you've got deductible of $750. You've got an out-of-pocket max of 1750 okay and when you're in between these two values which actually would be a lot if, if you actually do the math you'll recognize that a lot of spending would happen in between these two because remember this thousand dollar difference right here is what you spend out of pocket okay and for the expenses that you face between these two amounts here you cover 10 percent of the medical expense, all right? So what that means is, if you have $1,000 here, $1,000 that you have to spend out of pocket, it would take $10,000 in medical expenses to cover that difference, okay? So recall with a high deductible plan, we had a 20% rate. In this plan, we have a 10% rate, which lower is good, right? So that's, that's a good thing. All right, so now let's compare. And I'm just going to directly compare for me through all of these different expenses. So example one, let's say that my medical expenses are literally zero dollars. Okay. I want to make sure we understand what this would mean. If your medical expenses are zero dollars, what would you pay for all medical expenses total? All right. And in these questions, just like the question 10 on the quiz, we're going to go ahead and lump the premium into that. So it's kind of like, how much does health stuff cost you for the year? Well, if you have no medical expenses, the only thing you would pay would be your premiums, okay? So for the high deductible plan, you would end up with $3,360 in expenses. And for the comprehensive plan, you would end up with $7,120 in expenses. So if you don't spend anything, uh, your premiums would be the, be the result. That would be how much you would spend in the entire year, right? So if you don't go visit the doctor or anything, this is what you would pay. All right, so obviously if you're very healthy and not going to the doctor much, you would want to go high deductible. On top of this, you also get the HSA, which for me, I get a $750 match, right? Which makes it even better. Uh, a second example here, let's imagine you had $4,000 in expenses. You can sit down and, and see if you can verify my math, but I'm not going to worry about showing you guys the math because the worksheets are going to do a good job of that. You can take my word for it. This is about showing real world results, not so much about how teaching you how to solve for it. So what I did is I put this into the formulas and everything, and I find that it would cost me $7,360 if I had $4,000 in medical expenses, if I had the high deductible plan. Just to show you the math, because it's easy in this case, um, I would be paying my premiums of $3,360, and with the high deductible plan, the first $4,000 all comes out of pocket, so I would end up with $7,360 in expenses. On the contrary, for the comprehensive plan, you would end up paying $8,195 in expenses. So if you have $4,000 in medical expenses, the high deductible plan is a bit better than the comprehensive plan, and that's ignoring the fact that you also get the HSA. All right, continuing on, we're getting more and more expensive. We're getting less and less healthy. So now let's say you've got medical expenses of $10,000. Okay. So for me, that might be like the year that I have a kid and it's coming to about like that. So with a high deductible plan, this would end up coming out to $8,000. 880. Again, I did the math, but you could go back and verify that using what I've already told you. With a comprehensive plan, it comes out to $8,795. So the high deductible plan is still just marginally better. So if you have $10,000 in medical expenses, they're virtually a tie. But again, with the high deductible plan, you get the HSA, which I value at a significant amount of money. To me, an HSA is worth, you know, one or $2,000 a year to me in regards to the extra tax savings that I get. And then finally, let's imagine that you have medical expenses of 
one hundred thousand dollars or a million or ten million once you hit these levels it doesn't even matter because you're going to hit your out-of-pocket maximum well if you hit your out-of-pocket maximum then that would be the most you could possibly spend so the high deductible plan comes out to ten thousand seven hundred sixty and the comprehensive would be eight thousand eight hundred seventy okay so this is kind of like the worst case scenario for the high deductible plan and this is kind of like the worst case scenario for the comprehensive plan all right so as we go down and our expenses go up the comprehensive plan gets better all right and that's kind of what i'm just trying to show you guys here and you might think, you know, if you're trying to figure out which plan is better for you, you might first estimate what you expect your medical expenses to be, and then maybe try to find like a crossover point. Find the point where they are pretty much the same, and then ask yourself, are you going to probably spend less or more than that? That's a good way to think about it. All right. For me, it's not close. The high deductible plan, uh, uh, only one year would the comprehensive plan have ever been better for me, and all the other years, a high deductible plan would have been better. And that's ignoring, again, the HSA, which I get a $750 company match, right? So even in the worst case scenario here where there's about a $2,000 difference, I'm getting $750 put in my HSA. On top of that, I'm going to avoid income taxes, Medicare taxes, Social Security taxes on the front end and the back end, meaning money I put in my HSA, I will never be taxed on if I use it on medical expenses, which I suspect I will. So I don't mind, you know, occasionally having years where the high deductible plan is not ideal uh, because the HSA is still offered to me. That all being said, um, you can switch back and forth, all right? It's not like you'll ever lose your HSA. So if you know you're going to have a kid the next year, all right, you might be able to, depending on the rules in your plan, you might be able to switch over to a comprehensive plan for a year and then switch back. Um, if you know you're going to have surgery or something, you might be able to switch into a comprehensive and switch back. Also, some systems are uh, set up where they provide insurance to you after you retire. I think the University System of Georgia is like this. So once you retire, they'll stick you in one of these plans and you can stay in it all the way until death for pretty small fees. I've looked into that and it seems like I'll be better off switching to comprehensive as I get to the very end of my career to take advantage of that. Like all that stuff gets very advanced, gets very complicated, and I don't so much care if you know about that because you're so far away from retirement. Um, you probably really shouldn't be thinking about those things just yet. What I'd be thinking about now is lowering your costs now, okay? The less you have to spend on medical expenses, the more you can invest on other things. So if we can cut down on our medical expenses, that will help us push towards retirement. So that would be my goal. All right, other than what we've been talking about, other than the deductibles and the premiums being different, there's usually not significant differences between comprehensive and high deductible plans. Comprehensive plans do tend to have more copay based uh, things like going to your doctor and paying 20 or 30 bucks. That stuff is more common, but the monetary differences really aren't that substantial in most cases. Okay, so we talked about high deductible plans, high deductible plans, comprehensive plans. Let's now mention one more an HMO. This is a health maintenance organization. And what's really different about this plan is that it's it's almost like a membership. It's almost like a, being in a health club or something. So the plan has a network, and you really have to stay in the network. Okay, and the network is usually much more confined. All right. Uh, so it's, it, you know, in regards to like a high deductible or comprehensive plan, there's in-network versus out-of-network expenses like we talked about. But there's usually a lot of in-network options. But in regards to like an HMO, usually it's very strict, okay? There's very specific places you can go to get medical coverage uh, that's going to be covered by your insurance. Typically, these usually have high premiums and lots of of copays. So they're more like the comprehensive plan than they are like the high deductible plan, okay? 
um, and more will be covered. So gener generally, they're, they can all be very different, but usually the way HMOs work is you have high premiums, often higher than comprehensive. And then for your medical expenses, there's gonna be a lot of small charges that you have to make, okay? Typically, you will operate through a primary care physician, like your personal doctor. If you've ever heard somebody say like, do you have a primary care physician? A lot of times what they mean is like a doctor that you go to regularly for checkups and such. So a lot of times the way HMOs work is anytime you have a medical problem, you're gonna go to your primary care physician first, and then they're going to refer you to a specialist that's in network, all right? So it's kind of like having a health club membership and this is like your personal trainer or something, right? You go to your personal trainer for everything, but then your personal trainer might also say, I think you need to do some swimming, go see that person over there to start swimming. So that's kind of how the HMO works. Um, for me, I don't, the HMO is completely a non-option because our HMO doesn't have any doctors in Baldwin County, so I'm just not interested in it really at all. But this is, just so you know, probably not gonna be what you want most of the time because when you guys first graduate from college, the high deductible plan is just going to look so good that in comparison, this is not going to be such a good deal. These usually have very high premiums for healthy people. That's usually not what you want, and they don't give you access to the HSA. Okay, So with your first job, chances are you're going to have, you're going to have the high deductible plan almost for sure. You'll have something like the comprehensive plan almost for sure, and then you'll probably have one of these as well. Okay, That's something you might ask about in an interview. Plan ahead. All right, now we can finally wrap all of this up, all of this discussion of health insurance. Health insurance, an important topic, kind of an annoying topic to get through because it's all terminology and confusion, really. Um, so hopefully everything's making sense so far. This should be easy, uh, just learning about some financial instruments that are connected to health insurance. Uh, we already talked about how life insurance might be connected to health insurance in a prior video, so I'm not going to mention that here. But there are things you need to know, um, and this is where a lot of Confusion comes from people that I talk to all the time. They get these different instruments confused with one another, okay? Now, the king of all instruments, as we know, is the HSA. All right, HSA, hopefully you remember it, but a quick reminder of how this works. You can contribute up to $3,550 this year if you're single, up to $7,100 if you are in a... Uh, essentially a family plan or with a spouse, you can contribute up to $7,100. The money in your account can be used for just about any medical expense and there's no expiration date on your funds. So if you put money into an HSA, you can use it 20 years from now, regardless of whether you've switched plans or whatever, changed jobs, it doesn't matter. It's still your money. What's great about the HSA is it avoids all taxes that we've talked about. Income, both Georgia and federal, social security tax, and Medicare taxes. It avoids that when you put it in, like a traditional instrument. But if you withdraw it for medical expenses, you never pay any taxes at all, which makes it a tremendously good plan. At its very worst, it's kind of like a traditional 401k because you can always withdraw the money for any reason after you're 65. But at its very best, it's, it blows all the other instruments out of the water because it never pays any taxes if you're using it on medical expenses. So it's an amazingly good plan. Remember that the HSA is only available under a high deductible plan. We need to make sure we understand the HSA, okay? It can be invested, it's got a lot of huge benefits. Hopefully you remember that from a prior video. HSA is frequently confused with the second instrument, a healthcare FSA, sometimes called a medical FSA. I've argued with people several times about this because they think that these are the same thing. They get confused about what they are and people will make huge, huge five-figure mistakes in regards to their FSAs and HSAs, putting money in the wrong place. Um, this is a vehicle with some similarities to the HSA. All right, so let's, let's kind of think about the good here first. The good is it reduces all taxes, just like an HSA. So if you put $1,000 in an HSA, 
it reduces your taxable income by $1,000. If you put $1,000 in a healthcare FSA, it also reduces your taxable income by $1,000. All right, so that's good, no problem there. It can be used to cover pretty much the same medical expenses that the HSA covers, which is just about everything. I was just looking at the list, tons and tons of stuff on that list, you know, as long as it's something that is not just like off the wall, pretty much gonna be covered by uh, this FSA, okay? So that's the good thing about it, and you can contribute up to, I don't know where they got this value from, but you can contribute up to $2,700 into your healthcare FSA. All right, so that's the good stuff. So if you wanna put money in a healthcare FSA, you can put up to $2,700 in, and it will reduce your taxable income by $2,700. Sounds good so far. Well, let's talk about the bad now. So if that's the good stuff, here's the bad stuff. I'm gonna list these out in numbered order here. Um, the money cannot be invested. That's a big bummer. We know that the stock market on average returns about 10% per year. So you're missing out on returns here because the money's just gonna be sitting in account, gathering dust basically until you use it. All right, so that's kind of bad. Here's a really bad one. The funds expire at the end of the year. That's terrible, all right? So if you put money into a healthcare FSA uh, and at the end of the year you haven't used it, they just the money just evaporates. All right, it's very different from an HSA. I've gotten in a lot of arguments with people on both of these. They've told me I can't invest my HSA. I open my computer and I say, look, here's my HSA invested. They don't understand because they're talking about an FSA. They're confusing the two. I've had tell, people tell me I better spend the money in my HSA. Totally wrong. HSAs and FSAs, very different. The confusion is that they cover a lot of the same expenses and they show up on health insurance forms in similar places. Basically, the FSA is like the HSA, but it's only provided in non-high deductible plans. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and write this here now. Um, this is available for plans that don't have an HSA. And I think this is where a lot of the confusion comes from because you get two people talking about their health insurance plans. They don't know that they're on different plans and then they start talking about spending accounts they assume they're talking about the same thing. They are definitely not. The HSA is like the best thing ever, right? And the healthcare FSA is kind of meh. It's a good plan if you know you're gonna use the funds. Uh, my parents used to buy these all the time. They used to put a lot of money in a healthcare FSA and it was funny because a lot of times at the end of the year they'd have too much money in. One year they bought like 40 first aid kits to give out at Christmas because they had to spend it. They had no other way to spend the money. So they were just like, let's find something that we can we have eligible spending for. So there's stuff you can do with it. It's not a terrible account, um, but it definitely is nothing like the HSA. HSA is like, you better do it. HSA is like required saving. FSA is kind of, you can take it or leave it. It's not so great. Um, so the bad, the money cannot be invested. Um, the funds expire at the end of the year. That's probably the really bad things. Um, and I tell you what, that, that's probably enough to talk about in regards to the healthcare FSA. So, uh, if you have maybe an HMO or you have a comprehensive plan, you'll get access to this. Eh, take it or leave it. All right, it's a decent plan, but nothing amazing. It does reduce your taxes, so that's good. It's nothing like the HSA. All right, another option that you might have. A lot of y'all are gonna choose the high deductible plan. Well, you'll get access to this, a limited use FSA. I don't know if I've defined FSA. That stands for flexible spending account. All right, so a limited use FSA is a, uh, it's also similar to the HSA in a lot of regards, but it's nowhere near as good. It's the worst of these three. Um, it's available. To those with an HSA, I can just picture people complaining year after year and continuing to get stuff added to their accounts. You know, the people with high deductible plans are complaining. Those people are paying less taxes than us because their premiums are high. So they get the HSA. 
right? And these people complain and say, well, they've got an HSA. We should get something. They get an FSA. And then they're like, well, we should get something like an FSA. And then they get one too, right? So it all gets very complicated. But this is, a, you know, an okay plan. And if you have a high deductible account, which you probably will, this will be an option. And you might want to use it. Nothing super special, but it can reduce your taxes, you know? So it's similar to an HSA. It reduces all taxes. Just like all the other plans we're going to talk about right now. Reduces all taxes. But what's not good about this is it can only be used for vision and dental expenses. So the idea here is if you don't have a dental or vision insurance plan, it gives you a way to pay for that stuff if you really need it. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, you could use this if you have a lot of dental problems or, you know, put a hundred bucks in it every year, It'll save you 30 bucks in taxes. It's okay. Right. But the problem is there's no investments and the funds expire at the end of the year. You might get a little grace period with these funds. Um, you know, you, you might get an extra 45 days or so, but generally speaking, the funds expire at the end of the year. So it makes a limited US use FSA not so good. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about these on the quizzes or anything, but you should know sort of just very basically what they do, all right? Who's, has, who has access to them and what do they do in general? They all reduce taxes in the same way, so that should be easy. All right, so HSA, amazing. Healthcare FSA. Yeah, kind of good. Limited use FSA, not useless, but not especially fantastic either. And then the fourth one here, this one can be very, very good. Dependent care FSA, all right? I'll go ahead and tell you now. Oh, by the way, the maximum for this one here is $2,600. I don't know who the hell is going to put $2,600 in this account because you can only use it on dental and vision. So there you go. Uh, dependent care FSA, this is very different from the first three. Um, I don't know how this got lumped into health insurance. I'm sure it has to do with, you know, something that happened in regards to policy and people arguing about what political advantages certain individuals should have. I don't know. But the dependent care FSA is very different from the other ones. This is essentially available to everyone. Unlike the other accounts here, everyone gets the dependent care FSA and it's used to pay for healthcare, or excuse me, it's used to pay for daycare services and such, all right? It's text advantaged way to pay for daycare or whatever else. So if you're paying for a nanny, that, that's covered. If you're paying for your, like if your parents are watching your kid, you could pay them to do it, which would be advantageous because you would reduce your taxable income. So it reduces your taxable income, just like these other accounts. It reduces Social Security, Medicare, and income taxes. To me, this is really nice. I really like this. Um, I put in the maximum every year. The maximum is $5,000. All right, and so this is one of the things that I use every single year, and it saves me on taxes. So what happens is, every month, I get some funds put into my dependent care FSA, Instead of getting that money paid to my paycheck, where it would be first taxed, the money just spills into my dependent care FSA first. I then have this account that I can use to reimburse myself back for any education expenses that I have for young kids. Can't use this for like high schoolers or something. You can't pay for private school with it, but you can pay for them up until they're the age that they are provided free education. Free guaranteed education starts in kindergarten. So up until kindergarten, you can use one of these accounts, all right? I'm not gonna test you a lot on this, again, for the quiz, because some of you aren't ever gonna use this, but if you have kids and they're young, this is nice, because you can reduce your taxable income. Um, so just like the other one, it avoids or reduces your taxable income. For all of the taxable, uh, or for all the uh, taxes that could be payable to you, okay? So it's a nice one. It's a nice plan. So, you know, going through these, me personally, uh, I have a high deductible plan. So with a high deductible plan, which ones do I have access to? HSA, limited use FSA, dependent care FSA. Do I care about these plans? Well, I max this one out. I max this one out. All right. 
So I must think that these are pretty useful plans. My feeling is for the HSA, right? None better. That's the very best plan you can possibly find. It is fantastic. And my feeling on the dependent care FSA is look, I'm spending like, I spend like $14,000 a year on daycare expenses for my kids. So I might as well be reducing my taxes, right? It's kind of like there's no cost for me doing this, right? It reduces my taxes, no big deal, all right? Kind of an upper level thing here. Paying for your kids' daycare is tax, uh, it does reduce your taxes. So in other words, if you, by paying $12,000 a year for my kids to go to daycare, that actually does reduce my taxes. So education expenses or, or expenses to take to send your kid to daycare, those expenses themselves reduce your taxable income, but they only reduce your income taxes. They don't reduce your Social Security and Medicare. So this allows me to avoid Social Security and Medicare, which I like because that's, what, 7.65%. Yeah, nice savings. Let's see how much it comes out to. $5,000 times... Right, 6.2 plus 1.45 percent. Let's see how much this saves me every year. 382 dollars and 50 cents. And I'm always amazed because I talk to people about this, and they're like, "Oh, it's not worth it." You know, it's like it's not much money. You know, it's not a big deal. Eh, Social Security, Medicare, it's not. You know, it's not much money. I don't care. But like, if I offered you 382 dollars and 50 cents to do like an hour of work every year, you would take it, right? So think about this. If you could save an extra $383 a year for the entire period while your kids are in preschool, why would you not do it, right? Why would you not do it? So I'm not gonna test you much on this, okay? Because it's not applicable to, applicable to you right now. But once you get that first job, you have a young kid, use it. Why not? So just to make sure that we understand everything that we've seen so far, let's say that your income is $100,000, you contribute, let's say, $3,000 to an HSA, you contribute $1,000 to a limited use FSA, and you go ahead and max out that dependent care FSA, which by the way can be used also if you're looking for like a looking watching over your grandparents or something, if they're really old and can't take care of themselves, you can use it there too. Um, so, so thinking about these things in unison here, if this is what I did, how much taxes would I pay? You know, When they go to solve for my taxable income, what would they use? Well, all of this would be tax reduced for all versions of taxes, all right? So my taxable income here would end up being $91,000, all right? which is great because remember, your tax rates usually are a function of your income. So as your income goes up, you move up the tax brackets. So I'm gonna reduce my taxes where my tax rates are the highest. All right, that's really a big goal of this class. I would also say that if I did these three things and if you're advising a friend who's contributing, I would look at this and I'd be like, what the hell are you doing, all right? Why would you ever put any money in your limited use FSA unless your HSA is maxed out first. Money in your HSA has all the same advantages of a limited use FSA and none of the disadvantages. If you wanna pay for medical expenses, vision, dental, whatever, you can use your HSA. So the HSA is definitely better than the limited use FSA. So what I would recommend to you is, you know, if you're putting money into these accounts, completely fill up your HSA before you even think about going to the limited use FSA, okay? So a lot of details there that are really superfluous. I'm not gonna test you on every little detail, but I think for you as a person, you need to hear these things because it could be helpful to you personally. All right, that's the end of the health insurance stuff. If you have any questions, let me know.